Welcome. The Department of Otorhinolaryngology is proud to give you this comprehensive video on how to conduct the physical examination of the ear, nose, throat, and the head and neck area. Footages of actual patient examination and computer graphics of important structures like the tympanic membrane and the larynx will be shown. We hope that this presentation will be interesting enough to encourage our students to practice among themselves and on their patients what they will learn about these important structures of the human body. Let us now begin our journey of discovery. Before we begin with the actual examination, I would like to show you some of the basic instruments that we will use throughout this video. This is a head mirror, and this is the otoscope, this is the laryngeal mirror, nasal speculum, wooden tongue depressor, and a tuning fork. One of the most important instruments that we will be using is the head mirror. In otolaryngology, there is always a need for a source of light to examine the different passages and openings of the head. Yet ordinary diffuse light, such as flashlights, do not always suffice because of the shadowing effect they give. The examiner will need a system wherein the light would be concentrated to a point and within the examiner's line of vision. This may be done by using direct light, as in the use of electric headlight, but is also as well served with the use of the old and reliable head mirror. The advantages of the electric headlight and the head mirror is that it keeps the hands of the examiner free to manipulate and move the patient. It also maintains the examiner's stereoscopic vision and thus assists in depth of perception. An easy way to focus the head mirror are as follows. First, Note where the light source is. It should be to the side of the patient and slightly behind. If it is on the patient's right, then the mirror should be placed over the right eye and vice versa. Position the mirror over the dominant eye and look through the aperture. Close the other eye to remove the influence of binocular vision temporarily while focusing. Focus your eye at the point in space and adjust the mirror so that the light falls on this point. Correctly placed, there will be no shadows because the light will fall in the line of your vision. Now open the other eye and proceed with the examination. Before the actual examination, the patient must be positioned properly to facilitate the different procedures that are going to be done. The patient should sit erect with knees together and his or her head should be 10 to 12 inches away from the back of the chair. With small children, the child should sit on their watcher's lap with the child's legs between the legs of the watcher. The child's arms should then be folded across his chest while the watcher hugs the child gently. The use of headrest is discouraged since they will limit the mobility of the patient's head. Thank you. 
The physical examination of the head and neck is begun with an inspection of the area. The clinical eye of the examiner, which comes with experience, usually guides the inspection. Patients presenting with masses of the neck should also be observed for any changes in the mass during Valsalva's maneuver, which can point to a connection with the aerodigestive tract. Palpation should follow a thorough inspection of the head and neck. During palpation, the patient will often try to help the examiner by turning the head away and extending the neck. This position will result in tension of the muscles of the neck, making it difficult to palpate the important structures of the neck. To avoid this, place a hand on the patient's head and hold the head in a neutral and slightly flexed position toward the side being examined. This will put at rest the muscles of the neck, thus facilitating easier examination. During the examination of the neck, the examiner should try to palpate the different lymph node areas using the following sequence. First, preauricular. Second, postauricular. Third, occipital. Fourth, tonsillar, fifth, submandibular, sixth, submental, seven, superficial cervical, eight, posterior cervical chain, ninth, deep cervical chain, and tenth, supraclavicular. If masses are felt, they should be described as to their size, shape, delineation, mobility, consistency, and any tenderness. The thyroid gland is also palpated. This is best done from behind the patient. Place the fingers of both hands on the patient's neck so that the index fingers are just below the cricoid cartilage. The patient is then asked to swallow. As the patient swallows, the thyroid isthmus rises under your fingers. Rotate your fingers slightly downwards and laterally to feel as much of the lateral lobes as possible. Note the size, shape, and consistency of the gland and identify any nodules or tenderness. This will conclude the examination of the head and neck. Examination of the ear may start with inspection of the outer portion of the ear. You may do the inspection by using your head mirror and then shine a light to the ear. And then check for the normal structures such as the tragus, the antitragus, the helix, the antihelix, the triangular fossa, and the lobule. In some cases, there are congenitally absent antihelix, and this we described as bat ears. There can also be congenitally small ears, which we describe as microtia, and enlarged ears, which we describe as macrotia. And so after inspection of the outer portion of the ear, we proceed with the inspection of the external auditory canal. Inspection of the external auditory canal we have to make use of the otoscope. The auricle is retracted outward, backward, and outwards. And the speculum 
of the autoscope is inserted gently as you go in and try to look for the color any form of discharge in the external auditory canal. In some cases, you will not be able to evaluate the tympanic membrane because of the presence of cerumen, in which case you have to remove the cerumen first so as you may be able to describe and evaluate fully the uh, status of the tympanic membrane. Now, after cleaning the external auditory canal, you may start evaluating the status of the tympanic membrane. You normally see the annulus, the cone of light which is reflected anteriorly and inferiorly for the right tympanic membrane, the anterior and posterior malleolar folds, and the manubrium. In some cases, you will appreciate a perforation. You have to describe the location of the perforation as to whether it is central or peripheral. And you have to describe as well the degree of perforation in percentage. In some cases, you will also appreciate some discharge. It could either be mucoid or mucopurulent. The type of discharge will tell us the extent or maybe the chronicity of the ear infection. Evaluation of eustachian tube function may be done in two ways. First, you can ask the patient to do valsalvas maneuver. Ask the patient to pinch the nose and ask the patient to blow through the nose with the mouth closed. And you ask the patient to do this repeatedly while you are doing your otoscopy. You're actually testing for the movement of the tympanic membrane as it goes inwards and outwards. Secondly, you can also do eustachian tube function test by doing your pneumatic otoscopy. You have to make use of your soft speculum and compress air and try to observe movement of the tympanic membrane. Tuning fork tests are used in patients complaining of hearing loss. This test will help to differentiate between conductive sensory neural hearing loss. This test will require a quiet room and a tuning fork with a 5112 frequency or a 1024 frequency, as this tuning fork is within the range of human speech or human frequency.